Welcome to the Private Equity Exchange 2007, the only summit bridging the gaps between limited partners, private equity funds, corporate executives, and entrepreneurs. The Private Equity Exchange is the only venue where LPs, private equity firms, corporate executives, and entrepreneurs meet, enabling them to move quickly from ideas to deal crafting. The Private Equity Exchange, the largest private equity event in Europe for CEOs, funds, and LPs. Restructuring. The restructuring of listed companies. I think it's not a secret for you that restructuring of listed companies is much more complicated than restructuring of non-listed companies. And first of all, I'd like to address this rather general question to our speakers. What are the main differences? What are the key issues and the key differences between restructuring of listed and non-listed companies? I think we could say that uh, there is no, there, there are no specific provisions under uh, French law, under French insolvency law, uh, dealing with uh, listed uh, listed companies, and that could be uh, regarded as um, amazing, and which is probably more amazing is that, uh, uh, more generally, there are no provisions in the law uh, dealing with the shareholders, uh, whether the the company is listed or not. Uh, we must remind that uh, the French law is uh, supposed uh, to uh, get uh, three goals uh, uh, to uh, preserve the businesses, uh, to preserve the jobs in the company, and, and you know that this is in this order of priority to pay the creditors. And so you have uh, no provisions uh, at all uh, uh, talking about the shareholders in in the law, and uh, uh, if you if you uh, scrutinize the text uh, in, uh, of the French rules, um, uh, even uh, uh, w w either in the case of pre-insolvency proceeding or either in in uh, insolvency proceedings, you you could realize that there is only one provision talking about the shareholders, and it's a very particular case. Um, in the in a rehabilitation uh, uh, proced procedure, I mean, in dans a, in a redressement judiciaire, uh, when you have a modification of capital, uh, the receiver, the administrator, has to convoke uh, the the shareholders in the general assembly, so as to invite them uh, to uh, vote in favor to this modification of uh, capital which is uh, which is provided by the plan and this even takes place during uh, the observation period just before the plan to be uh, when when the plan is about to be to to be submitted uh, to the commercial court uh, that is to, to, to say that there is no other provisions in the law uh, uh, but of course um, I think uh, uh, an efficient administrator has to, to go beyond the law, beyond this legal obligation, so as uh, uh, to improve the information of the shareholders and uh, particularly to, to, to convoke a previous assembly uh, be, uh, uh, be, before this one uh, to improve the information to the shareholders. And of course, uh, um, uh, in the case of a listed company, um, I, I, I think the, the, the duty, one of the main duties of the, the administrator uh, is uh, to ant anticipate such obligation by communicating all the information uh, as soon as the procedure is opened, then during, all the, uh, the, during the whole observation period, uh, uh, for example, by uh, communicating to the regulator, to the AMF, all the reports submitting to the commercial court. And finally, at the end, of course, uh, the final rep report, which contains uh, the plan, uh, uh, the rehabilitation plan or the safeguard plan, which is uh, in this uh, final report, uh, which has to be uh, communicated, I think. It's not 
a legal obligation that which has to be communicated to uh, the French regulator to the AMF. Um, so um, uh, that's my my answer to this uh, to this point. Uh, we have no particular uh, uh, legal obligations, but I think we have to go beyond the text. How does securities law apprehend insolvent companies? Well, Laurent just described to us how insolvency law apprehends secure the securities world, the quoted world, and the answer is not a lot. The good news is that the AMF in its Reglement Judiciaire has acknowledged that there is such a thing as a troubled quoted company. The bad news is that it's gone only a small part of the way. In other words, what you have is whenever you have a mandatory takeover bid in France, which is when you cross the one-third threshold or the 50% threshold, in theory also the 95% threshold, uh, you have the right to apply to the council of the AMF for a derogation from the obligation to place a bid. Now that's extremely useful if, for instance, the existing shareholders are voting a rescue rights issue, which some shareholder is going to take up, because that way you can ensure that your capital goes into a capital increase, that you're not stuck with a difficult to measure amount, since it's largely decided by reference to an expertise, to be offered to the existing shareholders as a way of giving them liquidity. So that's good news and it often enables us to do transactions. The bad news is that only works if the company has been managed in what I would call a roughly competent manner. What do I mean by that? The AMF has not, and it's deliberate, it's not an accident, extended the derogation rule that applies to tender offers to prospectuses or other documents to be issued in connection with the issuance of securities. So if you're about to take over a quoted company that's a real absolute mess, as opposed to just a small mess, you will end up in a difficult position because the documents which require the visa of the AMF will have to be drawn up to the same standards as those of any other company. The theory behind that being that since you're basically placing securities in the market or alternatively soliciting from shareholders that they allow securities to be placed outside the market, the level of disclosure should actually be reasonably high. So we end up in this paradoxical situation where a company that's in trouble but's been roughly managed managed in a roughly professional way in terms of its financial reporting and securities law reporting can be saved, but a company that's a total mess in terms of the quality of its financials either cannot be saved or will take a long time to be saved and you'll need to cover it with a bridge loan. And a bridge loan is always a risky business and in restructuring even more so. By the way, you talked about the management and the important, important role of the management in this restructuring uh, process. And if we talk about uh, these, uh, the process of restructuring, are there any specific issues that affect the decision making and negotiation process when restructuring quoted companies? When you, you go into a, a normal company, I mean non-listed, non-public, uh, non coté non-public company uh, that uh, has uh, financial problems, uh, going through difficulties, it's a nightmare, okay? And uh, when it's quoted, it's a much bigger nightmare. And this is why maybe uh, I like it and uh, some of my friends like uh, this kind of difficulties. Uh, it's impossible to list all the uh, problems you may have when you're, you're dealing with a, a listed company. Uh, I just mentioned some of the points. Uh, there's a problem, for example, with uh, the fact that uh, if, in a case that I personally know, uh, the uh, negotiating party uh, owns only a minority of this uh, of the total uh, equity, then of course you need people to vote. So you need the market to vote with you. It may be a very different situation if you control 80% in your hands and uh, only 20% are on the market. But uh, I faced a situation where I only controlled a small amount. And therefore, I had two problems. Number one, uh, having enough people to vote in a general assembly, because of course you have minimum of uh, people to be voting, otherwise 
the vote is invalid, of course, you cannot even uh, hold the assembly. And number two, it's very difficult because you have to negotiate with people you don't meet, you don't know them. So you call for an assembly, so you have to wait for, what is it, about two weeks or something? Yes. Then here are the people coming. You don't really want to publish in magazines, we are in a bad situation, we want to open this and that from our uh, stockholders. And uh, here are the, so you don't, you don't want to talk about it, but at the same time you have to communicate with them. So the first time you're going to meet these people is when you're calling this assembly. So you meet people you've never seen in your life, and some have uh, one point of vote, some half a point, some three points, whatever it is. But you're going to need those, what is it, 20%, 25% or, or something yeah, on, the, on the second calling. Correct. So uh, it's going to be uh, difficult. Uh, to discuss with these people because they discover a situation in most cases they don't understand what you what you're talking about what you want why you want to do that it's not exact not at all the same when you have uh, other investors or minority equity holders that you can call for tomorrow morning okay gentlemen this is monday we meet wednesday morning 9 a.m in our office and then you talk to the people and you have I mean, smart people in front of you can understand the situation and you can call them on Friday and again on Monday, maybe work during the weekend. You cannot do that with your stakeholders when it's public because they're going to leave the room in about two hours because you call them at 10 a.m. and at noon they're hungry, so they go. And then what you do, because you didn't get the vote, because you have just started changing their mentality. Another problem, because I cannot mention them all, uh, is, uh, for example, when you have quoted bonds. Of course, when you have a convertible bond, I mean, uh, which is one of the situations, of course, uh, we may have, uh, you, of course, need to obtain the agreement from your stakeholders, uh, your friends' stakeholders, the other, uh, the public, if I may say, and you also need to obtain the agreement of the bondholders. And sometimes this doesn't match. So you're going to have a general assembly here, then the other assembly there, and you're going to have uh, all these uh, called conditions precedent. By the way, I just learned the word yesterday, okay, for this meeting. It means conditions suspensive, right? Uh, conditions precedent. We're going to have a lot of conditions precedent that must match and, like a puzzle, go into each, in each other in order to obtain your deal. It is very complicated. And you, of course, have the same problem with your convertible bond holders because they are, they are there sitting in front of you after the two week. Uh, meeting uh, time, so then you see them for the first time, and they don't really want to vote something that's bad for them, because they are not the real bosses, they just represent uh, this fund or that fund that deals with quoted lines, you know, your line, your line number 41, you know, 200 lines uh, organization, and they just come here, but they don't really have the vote the voting right, the voting power. So then they may leave the assembly, they don't vote yes positively, I mean, to the resolution you need, where you're going to make, organize some, converse, some conversion and some change in the equity. So it's a very, very complicated situation, and there are many, many other problems, like the, agree the agreement of uh, the market uh, regulatory office, AMF, in France, which is going to be there to give you an authorization or not the authorization to do what you need to do. You need to negotiate also with them. So in some cases, you negotiate with your assembly, with the AMF, with the French court if you're under receivership, etc., etc. So of course, it's a much, much bigger nightmare. Thank you. You know, I, I see that there are too much, too many problems in the restriction of uh, uh, listed companies, and you've, uh, you've, you've named these problems. And you know, I think that uh, what is the impact of media uh, in this process? I know we could understand that the negotiation process is very difficult, but uh, I think the uh, impact of media is also quite, uh, quite important. What do you think about it? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the uh, I'll take the stage now, if you if you yeah. if you wish. Now, I think it's more or less a question for the company uh, first, um, because the company is dealing with the IMF, is dealing with the press and, and the different stakeholders. But as a potential investor, you're right; it could be also used as a tool to force, influence, lobby the other stakeholders around the table. Uh, the company or the administrators or maybe the, the shareholders. So it's, I think it's more or less a question for the company first, but it, that can be used also by the potential investors that we may, that we may be. Can I, can I go maybe proceed a little bit? Um, 
let me step into the, you know, the investor shoes for a second, into interested in a listed situation. Um, I think the the, the decision making is, um, I mean, it's not that complex. I think the the most difficult part of, of, of such a deal is more or less for the for the company and its advisors to implement the process. So it's more a, a process of implementation issue than a decision making issue. As a potential investor, I see two advantages and maybe a couple of disadvantages. Advantages, I think it's a public situation so you could easily get uh, information. So for you to get up to speed into a situation it's quite easy because of the you know mandatory disclosures made by the company first second post restructuring since it's a listed company you may have an exit potentially in the market um, since it's listed and third i think um, i think um, it gives you more opportunities to position yourself into what we call the capital structure by uh, doing what we call some arbitrage, being long the debt and short the equity, for instance. Uh, although it is technically and practically pretty pretty difficult to do to, to do in you know in practice. In theory, it's uh, feasible. In practice, it's different. But the main advantage is at first getting access to the info. Second, potentially an exit post restructuring. And third, um, position yourself within the cap structure. The disadvantages as a potential investor are. I think twofold. First, I guess it's more it's it's time consuming to go through such a, a restructuring to implement such a restructuring, and second, um, you may, especially in France and especially in the case of your internal, you may end up giving up more value to the other stakeholders around the table. So depending on the jurisdiction you are working on, you may end up giving up more value um, just to you know to put the different stakeholders on board as Jean-Louis said, for them to vote in favor of restructuring. So it doesn't make a lot of difference as a potential investor. I think the, it's, more, it's more a matter of implementing the process and getting around uh, the shareholders um, mostly. Exactly. And talking about the process, I mean, I think about the lack of coordination. Um, if we talk about insolvency law and uh, tribunal de commerce, so it's, I mean, I've heard many cases when there is no coordination. Uh, how could you explain it and what can be done? Uh, I will try to answer, thank you. Um, <clears throat> as I told you, we have no specific provision in the text, so we have to be very pragmatic. Um, but I think the main issue is not really a lack of coordination between, on the one hand, the Tribunal de Commerce and on the other hand, the regulator, the IMF. Uh, the, the, we have no um, real different stakes. Uh, uh, I think we have surely no text. So we have, uh, we have no general theory. We, can, we cannot implement a systematical solution. And, um, uh, and uh, I believe that uh, in this framework, um, the, 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 the administrator has to play a, a, a role of interface between the commercial court and the regulator. And specific, um, um, especially, um, in fact, I think we, ha we, we are facing a, a cultural gap uh, between I, I'm sorry it could be a little uh, strong, but between uh, uh, the, the, the finance industry on the one hand and ju judicial proceedings on the other hand, we have a real cultural gap. For example, we have seen um, I, I, in, in, uh, during the past 10 years, I, ha I have uh, observed uh, a very amazing reactions of the market uh, facing to um, um, a rehabilitation procedure, a redressement judiciaire. Um, um, it's, it is an anecdote, but um, uh, I've seen a, a case where uh, when the plan at the end of the observation period is um, uh, achieved and when it, this plan is duly registered to the court, that means everybody can get 
uh, all the information contained in this plan, all the provisions of this plan, uh, and, and the business plan, for example. So all the information uh, get, get public. Uh, uh, we, 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 we observe that uh, the, um, the, the market is stable during this period. Uh, there is no movement on the market. Uh, even after the hearing at the court, uh, the, the quotation is uh, stable also. That's amazing. And this is just after the, uh, the plan is adopted by the court, by a judgment, that uh, you can uh, see the consequences of this plan in the market pl prices. Um, it takes some time, some time. And, and, it could make, and, it, and it could it some, take some, weeks. Yes, it, it could take weeks. Yes, and that's amazing. And I think is just uh, as as the market is supposed to be very uh, well informed. Uh, I think it's just a problem of a mis misunderstanding between two planets, uh, the, the finance uh, and and the, and and the court. And, and, and I think it's important, well, it's, it's, um, it's not uh, a very serious problem, it's an anecdote, but I think uh, the lessons of that is that um, the, 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 the insolvency practitioners, in, the general term, in broad terms, has to, have to, um, um, to check that the information which is provided to the court is well known by the market, is well understood by the market. That's one of our tasks, I believe. We, we can tell you that, the, I mean, from our experience, I think we talk about that because we prepared that meeting. Maybe it doesn't look like, but we have prepared together last week. And we, we, uh, we have realized that uh, when an information about on a public company uh, explains that this company is under bankruptcy or in a very bad situation, in a mandate or uh, a different situation, uh, like a receivership or, some, or something, uh, the quotation uh, uh, remains at a certain level. That's too high. It shouldn't be that high. There's a big resistance effect on the market. The value doesn't want to go down. This is what you, you explained to. And in a case you mentioned also uh, that uh, a company that had that was a judgment and the company, uh, the assets, it was an asset deal and therefore the next day, the next hour, the company is empty and the market price was going up on the company that, that is empty within the next minute. Because uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Because of the semantic, because of a semantic confusion. Because, uh, as you know, in France, uh, a deal, an, an asset, um, a sale of assets of a company is called plan de redressement par voie de cession d'entreprise. Plan de redressement. And this is a semantic confusion, and there is, there is an appearance for the market mm -hmm. that it is a real recovery. But, the, the, in the, in the ex example that you're talking about, the, 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 the assets of the company was where, I'm sorry for my English, were sold uh, for by a decision of court. By a decision of a court for a price uh, which uh, couldn't allow to uh, repay the creditors and of course uh, certainly uh, not the equity holders. Not any resource, not any value for the shareholders. Yeah, I mean, effectively in that area you have four levels of misunderstanding and confusion. Let's start with the courts. Many of the insolvent businesses are outside of the big cities. Now when you are in saint dié des vosges and the presiding judge uh, used to run a quarry with 15 employees, uh, you have to literally spend two, three hours explaining to the court behind closed doors how the equity markets work, what is the function of the AMF, what you can and cannot actually do as a matter of securities law because quite legitimately that court in the middle of nowhere has virtually never had to handle a quoted company and when the one company that happens to be quoted within 30, a 30 mile radius of the courthouse happens to be in trouble, all of a sudden for the first time of their lives they actually have to address their minds to these types of issues. So there's a big learning curve for the judiciary in many cases. Obviously if you're in Paris or Nanterre it's rather different, but when you're in the middle of nowhere and many insolvent businesses businesses are in the middle of nowhere, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Sec yeah. Second level of problem uh, is the AMF. 
Uh, the AMF itself, the line, the line people, have got two problems. One, half of them don't exactly understand how insolvency works, and you've got to work them through it. Uh, and two, the ones that do understand sort of worry about market integrity issues, such as, yes, that will let you save the company. In this case, and it's good for the shareholders as well, because they'll get something as opposed to nothing, even if that something is not a lot. Uh, but on the other hand, am I creating some kind of bad precedent about the quality of disclosure that a company's security is about the level of accounting that I require? Isn't it precisely when a company is in difficulty that communication should be absolutely 100% perfect so that people can make up their mind in a context that's by definition difficult? So the AMF also has a learning curve. Individual investors are just a mess mm. uh, for a very simple reason. In nine cases out of ten, by the time a quoted company runs into trouble, the institutionals vote with their feet and move out. <laughs> so you'd, you're dealing uh, with basically uh, a range of people uh, who rank, they run the whole gamut. You've got the family. The business was founded by great granddaddy. It's sentimental. We want control. It's our business. We can't sell. Somehow save it. We don't care about money. Save the business. Fine. You've got individual investors who figure, hey, the company's dropped 90%. It's got to rise again because when you've had a 90% drop, that's an opportunity, right? <laughs> Try and explain to them that in insolvency law, you can actually lose 100%. Good luck. Uh, and then you've got the uh, guys who got involved with it through sh basically and fall in love with the case and forget that they're supposed to be there uh, to look after their interests. I mean, at one of the Eurotunnel general meetings, I was approached uh, by what should have been a disgruntled shareholder, because he had several million Eurotunnel shares who at that time had lost quite a bit of uh, money. And he looks up and he goes, Maître. Between you and I, we may lose our money, but God, did we have fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, trying to do some financially rational stuff with people like that is a bit of a challenge. <laughs> and last but not least, we have, uh, in many cases, a bunch of crooks. Uh, what the crooks are looking for, in many cases, are fees at the expense of the shareholders. I was involved in a quoted restructuring, which will remain nameless, where we were sponsoring a plan de continuation in which my client was getting the bulk of the equity, but leaving some equity on the table for the shareholders. And there was this consultant who was selling himself to the minority shareholders, or soon to be minority shareholders, telling them he knew everything about you know, restructuring financial businesses. And it was absolutely outrageous that we should take X percent of the equity, and why don't they pay a quarter of a million euros to federate them so that they can fight the continuation plan, which left them with some equity, because they would be far better off under a sales plan where they got zilch. Now, basically, those kind of people tend to surface, unfortunately, and you spend a lot of your time fighting disinformation from people who are basically out there to make a quick buck. So, you know, in a sense, the, the problem of information in these transactions is a universal problem. Uh, you, you, you mentioned the, uh, the case of Eurotunnel. Uh, could you tell me, um, each of you, what lessons can be learned and what lessons to be learned from a Eurotunnel case? Okay. Thank you. Um, um, I was uh, I was one of the two administrators of um, Euroton the Eurotunnel group, and um, I think at this stage it uh, remains for me very difficult to to learn uh, lessons from this fight. And uh, you could be a little disappointed with my answer. I'm sorry. Uh, I um, I have to to tell you that. Um, uh, um, several topics about Eurotunnel 5 uh, are very uh, are very important even nowadays, and there are uh, com creditors uh, are, are complaining about uh, the solution which has been implemented. So I'm not really free uh, to to speak about several topics about uh, this, this file uh, and particularly we could say that it's not uh, uh, it's not highly classified particularly about the the bondholders 
because the, uh, a part of the bondholders dis are disputing today uh, the plan which has been adopted by the, the, the Commercial Court of Paris. But, um, well, as you know in this file, we have, my counterpart and myself, we have to strike a balance between uh, um, very antagonist uh, stakes, um, very opposite stakes. Um, first, the, uh, the senior creditors, uh, second, uh, the, the subordinated creditors, and then um, the shareholders. And um, uh, that was very difficult to strike the balance because uh, as a professional of uh, insolvency, uh, everybody knows that in such a case, when, uh, when a company is in default of payment, the value of his company is, uh, uh, um, the, the company has no more value. That's theoretically, theoretically, sorry, theoretically, 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 theoretically. Uh, that's uh, the equity value is negative. Equity value, company value may be positive. Uh, company, right. oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, the equity value, value. Okay, enterprise value, if you want. Well, uh, uh, the, the, pr the 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 practice now is that uh, it is uh, um, generally cons uh, considered uh, that uh, the shareholders had no uh, value left. Uh, in such a, a restructuring. Well, it's very difficult to find values for the shareholders. And, um, uh, in the, and, and that was, uh, of course, uh, the recommendation of uh, uh, the main creditors uh, in this file, in, in the in Eurotunnel uh, group, because um, uh, pl uh, plenty of uh, uh, creditors uh, regarded uh, uh, the, the well considered that uh, all the values of the, all the value of the company should be distributed to the creditors and that's all in fact uh, and, and as you know there is a uh, first we are in France and uh, we have uh, l'exception française uh, and but I think uh, we have also uh, a, a, a numerous shareholders we have eight 100,000 shareholders, uh, 600,000 in France, located in France, 200,000 uh, in, uh, in the United Kingdom, and we have also a, a political uh, uh, issue. Uh, and so the solution was to find, as you know, uh, a, a solution uh, uh, to leave to the former shareholders uh, a significant part of the capital of the new company which has been created. And as you know, this new company, the new company Eurotunnel, has launched uh, an exchange of, uh, a public exchange of shares, uh, so that at the end of the day, uh, so that at the end of the day, the, um, the, 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 the current shareholders, well, the former shareholders, could uh, keep 13% of the new company and that was, uh, and, 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 and all the, the, the main issue was to, for the creditors to accept this uh, distribution of value. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to know the, uh, the point of view uh, of Xavier from the point of view of investor. What do you think about Eurotunnel Group case? Yeah, if, if, if I think I'll, I'll keep my, uh, you know, my actual position man, instead of you know, talking about my former experience at Eurotunnel. But as uh, Laurent said, the men issue was, those to, was to deal with different type of stakeholders, diverse and numerous type of stakeholders. And as I mentioned previously, we ended up by giving up more value to the, um, to the shareholders than anticipated or as the, um, the law may have um, you know, allowed us to do. Um, the other thing is that um, uh, obviously you'll have, uh, you know, being part of the stakeholders, you'll have the politics, you'll have the media around the table, so the process of implementation of the plan was time consuming and very likely more complex. Um, so, well, this is my main point. Um, obviously, you know, there was a huge mispricing and discre discrepancy in terms of level of, of information between the different, different stakeholders in the cap structure. But as, as I said, you know, practically 
catching that mispricing opportunity was very difficult and pretty risky due to the short squeeze um, risk um, that uh, you know we we may we faced actually. So Mendelssohn was uh, that dealing with a lot of stakeholders was difficult, and we ended up by giving up more value to the shareholders. So basically, my, the Mendelssohn as a potential investor in France is that based on the jurisdiction, French jurisdiction, I think going through such complex restructuring is difficult, and you may end up giving up more value away from, uh, from, from you. Well, I share an embarrassment uh, with Laurent, uh, meaning that I too uh, used to work for Eurotunnel. I was their insolvency lawyer for a couple of years. Uh, so I have lots of interesting stories and you're not going to hear any of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing. If I have to do one quick lesson before opening it up for questions, uh, it's the old principle of KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, there were so many layers of different stakeholders in Eurotunnel uh, that the rescue almost failed to materialize for what is basically a very nice performing infrastructure asset. I mean, if the financial engineers had basically uh, behaved in a less imaginative uh, way and not burdened the company with an almost insuperable level of complexity in their financial arrangements, the company would have been turned around and saved probably a lot more easily. Now, my co-panelists and I have been informed by Pierre Etienne, who's looking at me with very cross eyes, <laughs> uh, that it's time for the one-on-one -on -one questions, but we feel like answering questions. So if any of you have questions, go ahead. Well, I have one question that I'm very curious about, and I know probably it's for David. How regulation about uh, restructuring of listed companies should be or might be changed? You have a couple of hours? <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> uh, just, uh, one just word, each, each one word word? Um, yeah, just one well, more word. Uh, to, uh, um, um, uh, to me, uh, as I told you, uh, I think the, the current process could be regarded as uh, efficient, in fact, because uh, this is a, we have to adopt a pragmatic attitude. Uh, and we, don't, uh, uh, we have to improve, certainly, uh, the quality of information provided to the shareholders when we restructure listed companies, that's sure. But I don't think we need a, a new bill to do that, we have to just to improve the, and to, to set up uh, best practices. What I would like is a single change to the Règlement Général of the AMF. I would like a provision that says that the Conseil Général de l'AMF can waive absolutely any provision in the Règlement Général <laughs> when and if it sees it as fit, if in the Conseil's view it is necessary to permit the salvage of an otherwise insolvent entity. Exactly the provision which they have for tender offers, I'd like them to extend to their other rules. Let them be the decision makers, but I want them the, to have the ability to take an appropriate decision. Thank yeah. you. No, I just want to add mm -hmm. that w once again, like in uh, all companies, when there are contradictory or opposite, opposite decisions for AMF on one side and French court, for example, on the other side, uh, it's always the same final solution. The final solution is in the hand of the manager of the company. He has to think, when I do this, I do that. And he has to try to find, uh, c'est un prototype, comme on dit en anglais, it's a prototype, prototype, same word. Uh, each company that you are trying to restructure is a prototype. And you have, when you're a, a company CEO, you have to find yourself the solutions. It's very kind of experimental, but you usually find the right solutions if you're not too stupid. Xavier, what is your wish? Well, two, two wishes actually. Um, while as an investor, so while having access to the, uh, the private information, I would like to short the equity, straightforward. And uh, I would also, um, the um, French legal system, to provide more cram down mechanism in France for potential creditors to get around the shareholders and force and implement a restructuring plan. Okay, perfect. Thank you ever so much for your participation. We highly appreciate it.